And we are live with Lance Wendland. Lance, how are you this evening? I've been already been tr- had been gag ordered. I've already been gag ordered on this podcast to not <laughs> use any inappropriate language. Okay, so this is starting with censorship. I'm currently being held <laughs> under censorship. <laughs> let's uh, start the let's start the program. All I said was it's a G rated program, and it's uh, it is for uh, for work and, and people in technology hate to These hear. These colors don't run. That's the thing is <laughs> that hate, these colors don't they run. They hate the F word, and I know you like to use you the F what? word occasionally. You know what? What? I'll say whatever I want to say on the program. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that, and I was never Who's concerned. Boss? Who's you boss? Are. I'm you boss. Definitely, you're definitely I'm boss. boss. I'm Today boss. we are talking about technology and music. Has technology made music better? Talking with Lance Wendland, singer-songwriter, formerly at EMI Music Nashville, and Glenn Campbell, Nashville, also a technology futurist. Lance uh, specializes. Jabberwocky. <laughs> That's your safe word, I'm assuming. That is my safe word. <laughs> he specializes in AS400, Fortran, COBOL, and he is going to make his millions by mining oh. Bitcoin once he figures out how to get a shovel through the computer screen. <laughs> Oh, I'm just reading gosh. what I'm just reading what your oh, PR person God. gave that's, me to read. That's super fresh. That's super <laughs> Thank you. fresh. Wow. Yeah. Are that's, you a, that's, are you able have you figured out how to great. get the shovel through the screen or not? I'm anti Bitcoin. I've told you this before. It <laughs> I know uses that's why I bring it up. Energy. Okay. I, Bitcoin I is destroying our environment. It's technology. It's supposed to be like we're gonna use computers so we didn't have to cut trees down to make paper stuff and now we're using so much of some rigmarole cryptocurrency that it's all the gerbils are spinning at 11 when they're set to 10 i mean well, come on the thing, how are the russians going to make their money okay anyway let's talk about politics religion uh, or something Booze and that's hookers, controversial the way, <laughs> the way russians have always made money thank Booze you and hooker, vodka and hookers okay let's um, we will continue on with our conversation um, and, and getting right into uh, what you do, which is songwriting. Um, you do all the components of songwriting, the production and the distribution. Uh, but the, um, the songwriting piece in particular, there is new technology that allows people to create chord progressions without knowing how to play an instrument. That's something very new over the last 20 years or so. So there's non, non, what pe- some people would consider non-musicians now creating songs um, and some of the biggest songs that are on the radio, um, although there's a lot of great artists still out there. Uh, but what, um, what's your take on has, has the technology around songwriting made songs better or worse or something else? I think it's made them both. I, um, I think that they are, they're both better and worse. I think that sonically music has never been better. And I think that from a creative standpoint, from a, from a kind of an, an emotional depth uh, perspective, when it comes to songwriting, I think it's probably never been worse. And so it's a little bit of uh, it's a little bit of both, right? It's the, we lean on machines very heavily and it's easy to lean on them, right? Cause the stuff sounds good when you use a lot of machines, but there's a point too where it just kind of robs you. I think of the soul of the music, and I think there's a lot of that around. Why do you think you don't hear bands like Kansas or Rush, uh, or the bands in the '80s that were more complex? Rush, of course, was in the '80s, but um, yeah, late '70s and '80s. Yeah, the Kings, yeah. the Kings X type of bands. Um, you know, there's well, a, there Dream a lot Theater of, and yeah. Queensrÿche, and right, and you know, there's all kinds. There was all kinds of great. Bands yeah. that did cool stuff. I mean, you know, I mean, Def Leppard and Night Ranger, and on yeah. and on and on. There's all kinds of. Re- I mean, The Cure. There's and all there's kinds some, of cool stuff. In all fairness, there's some great musicians still out there, but what you tend to hear on pop radio tends to be that one, four, five, minor six. Every song is that, and kind of sounds the same. Is that because of the technology, or is it because it's what people want to hear and it's easy listening? Well, I think with the, the the most popular stuff, I think it's because that's what people want to hear. And I think the those the most popular stuff, I think the Nicki Minaj kind of stuff is, you know, producers, very seasoned musicians are 
putting those tracks together and they're they're huge sounds, super pristine, monstrous sounding instruments, and they put together pop little pop hook melodies and and um you know, and a lot of times there the, there isn't a real depth emotionally with it, but I think that it sounds incredible. So I think um for the top stuff that's what you have. That's what you're gonna get, right? It's sonically pristine and it's emotionally very shallow. And, sure. and I should it isn't just the emotion of it, it's it's the it just really lacks soul badly. The um you know, I a lot of people probably don't realize this, but there's a group of musicians it that might be the play, same thing. It might be the same thing. Yeah. yeah. There's, yeah. there's a group of musicians that play on, you know, 90% of what you hear on the radio, the same players are playing on those, on those records. Those are studio musicians. Nashville really started that. Um, Chet Atkins. Uh, I'm not sure that Nashville started, started it. They were doing it and, you know, right. The wrecking crew was going. The wrecking there was crew a, of, yeah. The wrecking crew out of LA. Yeah. But, and there were groups that there were guys in New York too doing the same thing. But it was the same. It's the same. It's the same Concept. cats. Yeah. The same cats as they ooh, like ooh. to say. Ooh. Chet Atkins took that and, and made it into a science, take the very best players. And uh, I'm not sure that, Chet, again, right. The Swampers, I think, we're doing that same exact sort of thing about that same time. The the Scatolites, if you've ever listened to uh, reggae music, it's almost it's exactly the same as L.A. or New York or Nashville, where they or or Muscle Shoals, where they have a a single basically group of guys doing all the music tracks. The Scatolites were doing that for all the reggae coming out of Kingston in the seventies. Sure. What today's technology allows for, though, is for people who don't have access to those studio players, they can create pristine, great tracks without having to go to a studio yeah. player. And yeah. unlike, you know, the 70s, 80s, 60s, 70s, 80s, you don't have to play your own music. You don't have to play your own instrument. You don't have to be a guitar player or a bass player or a drummer. Um, you can just use the the virtual instruments. In some ways, that maybe makes it equal, you know, it, it, it evens the playing it's field a, on for some level, but non players. I mean, it's, but technology can be an instrument too with, in the right hands. I mean, so I do think that there's a lot of good stuff that's really, you could do great stuff pretty simply, but there's also a level of guy with technology that has kind of made an instrument out of the softwares and the hardwares put together, you know, I think yeah. there's cool stuff that's going on. I think we'd both agree the music is not as complex today as it was in the seventies um, or the eighties on, yeah, on pop radio, on I pop mean, radio, on pop radio. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say that there are, there are changes that occur in pop radio, but it feels like cut and paste kind of changes that goes on. Whereas I don't, I think when you listen back to Kansas stuff or, or old rush stuff. I mean, it doesn't, you know, it has, it's the furthest away from cut and paste that you could possibly get. So, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that maybe brings us to the recording process itself. Uh, what's, what is your feeling on what technology has done for the average musician for recording their own stuff? Well, it's been great, right? It's made, it's been, um, it's allowed for, everybody essentially that owns a PC to have access to borderline major studio level recording. You know, now there are some, still some nuance, there's still some nuance to that. Like getting an incredible vocal sound requires a specific room. A lot of times it requires a specific microphone and, and, and signal chain, but you can get very, very close um, nowadays with just a, you know, a kid in a, in a back basement, well, like the uh, Eilishes did with Billy Eilish, right? I mean, that stuff's it's you can you can do national level recordings, especially like what they did it with, with using the loops and virtual instruments with you know in a back bedroom. Yeah, and that's something that uh, people probably don't recognize. The process used to be you had to save up all your money and go into a studio, and you'd have your band would have to be tight and ready to lay down tracks. And oftentimes they wouldn't be. And so you'd hire studio musicians if you weren't a really good player. And um, in today's world, you can sit instead of that and spending 10,000 or $20,000 minimum in today's world, you pop open your, 
your laptop and, um, you know, with, with maybe spending, I don't know, $500 or less, you can create a pretty darn good recording. Yeah. There, and there was a period where there was a lot of, you know, it got to the point in rock music where the players were competent enough where they mostly were recording their own stuff, but that was probably well into the eighties. Yeah, for sure. The players were players and, but that that's, decreased although again the the studio guys of the studio players have always been out there the guys that are professional musicians who yeah. make their living yep. playing yep. on records um you and i experienced that when we went to nashville and uh and saw how great of players they are um and and uh yeah and the and the labels don't want to pay for for young artists to take three you know three takes or five takes or ten takes to get it right they want to they want to pay Tom. Yeah, Kukovac they want to just, yeah, play the one take, coolest yeah. track ever down in two takes. So, because it saves money, time is money. Um, a final final thought on distribution. This one again is a no brainer. I would say, and technology has clearly made it better. What What's your thoughts on how technology has impacted distribution for the average musician? Well, it's. I think that for especially for younger people that are that want to do, you know, that are willing to promote their own music, I think that it's incredible, right? You go out on YouTube, you do videos, you can follow up, and I mean, I'm the wrong guy to ask because I'm not exactly a, I'm not a, exactly a promotional machine, but I think that for someone who I think someone with the ambition to be has a lot of channels. Yeah, yes, that is one thing that, um, again, the playing field has been leveled, and for people that are ambitious and willing to market themselves, it may they may not be the best musicians. Sometimes they are. Sometimes they are. When you go to YouTube, there's some unbelievable players. Oh yeah, no, there's some that have good, players really there. good, yeah, really good Absolutely. followings. Um, yeah, and uh, and so that that part of it, it acts that would never have gotten signed without uh yeah without, absolutely. without uh youtube um yeah. i'm thinking like they would have ended up those guys would have ended up support and supporting bands for different acts though so, you know those the guys that are big stars on youtube like the charles berthaud and davy 528 or whatever the, those bass players those guys would be playing some, for somebody i mean they're too good not to be well, maybe, right? You think back to some great players that never got record deals back in the day, and and oh, but well, today I mean, these guys are mind blowing. Yeah, some of the kids yeah. on YouTube are so good. Yeah, and it has awesome. helped in that the training part, the teaching part, has been. It's never been better. Are, yeah, you have yeah. access to world class teachers with Rick Beatos, and and again, I mentioned they're um, all over, right? They're all over yeah, YouTube. Book of Acts out there, and Tim Pierce is out there, and so studio players the best studio players in the world are out there giving uh tutorials to people which is really i've learned a great more thing. from watching scott's bass lessons just free youtube clips from scott's bass lessons than i did playing for 25 years before yeah. that you know it's yeah. just it's a huge it's a huge uh huge learning opportunity so final say technology overall has it helped or hurt music both. Yeah, that's you're such a fence it's walker. True. It's true. Yeah. It's Lance true. Wallen, thanks for your time. Have yourself a great rest of your week. And uh thanks for being the first person on the video new video cast. Oh, that's exciting. Yes. Bye bye. Bye.